Distinguished future musicians, welcome to Stomp on Step 1, the only free video series that helps you study more efficiently by focusing on the highest yield material. In this video, I'm going to be covering phenylketonuria, sorbitol and its effects on cataracts and diabetics, as well as galactose and fructose disorders. This is the first video in a set of six videos in the biochem section, so after this video I suggest you check out the rest of these. Phenylalanine is an essential amino acid that's going to be broken down into tyrosine through the action of the enzyme phenylalanine hydroxylase and its cofactor THB or tetrahydrobiopterin. Phenylalanine is turned into tyrosine, which can then be converted to different kinds of catecholamines and melanin and some other stuff. You can see that I give phenylketonuria, or PKU, a high yield rating of 3. For those of you who don't know what that is, it is a rating scale from 0 to 10 that gives you a rough estimate for how important each topic is to step 1. And if you're interested in learning more about the high yield rating, you can go to my website here. So PKU, or phenylketonuria, is just what it sounds like, having phenyl ketones in the urine. And it is caused by a deficiency of either phenylalanine hydroxylase, the enzyme, or a deficiency of its cofactor, THB. Both deficiencies present pretty similarly because they prevent phenylalanine from being converted into tyrosine. And the lack of tyrosine causes multiple problems because tyrosine is then converted to many essential things in the body. When you're not converting phenylalanine to tyrosine, it builds up in the body and then gets excreted in the urine. You treat PKU the same way you would treat a lot of different enzyme deficiencies. You're going to try to restrict the substrate from the person's diet and give whatever product it is. So you're going to try to put this patient on a diet that limits the amount of phenylalanine they take in and also supplement tyrosine through some sort of vitamin. For PKU, you also need to keep in mind that patients need to avoid aspartame. Aspartame is a sweetener that's used in a lot of products, most commonly diet soda. Aspartame needs to be avoided in PKU because although aspartame does not cause problem in these patients, aspartame is broken down into phenylalanine and a couple other things. If a PKU patient is drinking a lot of diet soda, it's the same thing as just consuming tons of phenylalanine because it's eventually going to get there. Here are some of the most common clinical presentations of PKU. The thing that I look at as the biggest red flag to screen PKU is a mousy odor. That's the term they most often use in these questions with PKU, which I don't really understand because I don't know what a mouse smells like. I don't know about you guys. I'm told it means musty or maybe moldy, something like that. Thankfully, the USMLE has not yet developed smell vision for their exams, so you don't really need to know what mousy odor is. You just need to know when you see mousy odor, pick PKU as the answer. You can also have mental retardation, seizures, and albinism. And the albinism is because tyrosine is used to create melanin, so if you don't have tyrosine, you're not going to have melanin. Sorbitol is the alcohol version of glucose, and tissues make a little bit of sorbitol sometimes to help sequester the sugar in that tissue so it'll have it to use later. In small amounts, sorbitol doesn't create any problems because there is a enzyme called sorbitol dehydrogenase that will get rid of excess sorbitol and turn it into harmless fructose. However, there are certain situations where excess sorbitol can become an, a problem. Some tissues, mainly tissues in the eye, do not have a whole lot of sorb sorbitol dehydrogenase. This means if there is extra sugar around, for example in a diabetic patient who's chronically hyperglycemic, you're going to have a lot of glucose, which means you're going to end up with more sorbitol, and that sorbitol is not going to be able to be completely metabolized by sorbitol dehydrogenase. This extra sorbitol is going to build up and cause damage to the cells through osmosis and the traveling of water to balance out the different amount of solute particles. This osmotic damage can lead to various kinds of damage in the visual pathway and other organs. And the most common effect is going to be cataracts in diabetic patients, which you can see here. 
Fructose is a sugar similar to glucose that we consume in our diets, and it can be used to create energy or create glucose by this pathway. There's two steps. Well, two steps that I'm going to be looking at here. The actual system's a little bit more complicated than that, but I'm just trying to give you the highest yield points. So the first step here is converting fructose into fructose 1-phosphate, and then the fructose 1-phosphate is acted on by aldolase B. And then there's a few more steps, and then that sugar that you're ending up with can be used in glycolysis or gluconeogenesis to either make more glucose or create energy to be used. Essential fructoseuria is a deficiency of that first enzyme, the fructokinase. So this means you're not going to be able to con convert fructose to fructose 1-phosphate, and the fructose that you consume is going to build up and doesn't really have any effects because fructose on its own doesn't really cause any problems. You just sort of pee out the excess fructose. So essential fructoseuria doesn't really have a whole lot of symptoms most often, and there's no treatment really necessary for it. However, hereditary fructose intolerance is a deficiency of that second enzyme, aldolase B, and that can create some pretty severe problems. You can see hepatomegaly, jaundice, vomiting, and hypoglycemia. And the hypoglycemia is because you're no longer able to convert fructose to glucose, but also because you're having this fructose 1-phosphate build up. And as that builds up, it's sort of stealing away all the phosphates from the other pathways. And that prevents you from having enough ATP available to make glucose. The treatment for hereditary fructose intolerance would be to help patients avoid consuming fructose. So you would put them on some sort of diet that cuts down on the amount of this fructose sugar. And at the same time, you also want to limit their amount of sucrose intake. And sucrose is basically just table sugar, and sucrose is a disaccharide. It's two sugars, and one of those sugars is fructose. So limiting fructose is not enough on its own. You also need to limit sucrose because when sucrose is metabolized, it's turned into fructose. You usually won't see either of these conditions show up to in a patient until after they stop breastfeeding because breast milk doesn't really have a lot of fructose. So when someone when the child is moved to a formula which may have fructose or starts eating solid foods, then you might see some of these symptoms arise. Now we can move on to disorders of galactose. Galactose again is another sugar, not that different from glucose. It's going to be acted on galactokinase to become galactose 1-phosphate, and then through a couple of steps, the first of which is the, through the enzyme uridyl transferase, galactose is eventually used to either create sugar or create energy through glycolysis and gluconeogenesis. And these disorders of galactose I'm about to tell you about tend to be more severe than the fructose disorders because while fructose can just be excreted in the urine, and doesn't really build up, galactose can build up and accumulate in tissues causing damage. That's because galactose can be converted into galactitol, which is hard to say, but I think I got it close enough, which is just the alcohol version of galactose. So that can build up in tissues and cause damage, unlike fructose, which doesn't have an alcoholic version like this. So galactokinase deficiency is what it sounds like. It's just a deficiency of the galactokinase enzyme, which is the first step in that galactokinase pathway. And it's a little bit more mild than the next one we're going to talk about, but it can cause cataracts through osmotic damage similar to sorbitol. And the treatment for that would be avoiding galactose and, more importantly, avoiding lactose. Again, lactose is a disaccharide, and one of the sugars in it is galactose. So you need to avoid galactose and lactose in your diet when you have galactokinase deficiency. So this would be like milk and all that stuff. Galactosemia is a bit more severe. It's a deficiency of galacto-1-phosphate uridyl transferase, which is the second enzyme in that pathway I just showed you. 
and it can cause cataracts just like galactokinase deficiency but can also cause jaundice hepatomegaly and mental retardation again the treatment is avoiding lactose and galactose both of these galactose disorders and both of the fructose disorders I mentioned so far are all autosomal recessive, which is pretty common among enzyme deficiencies. Both of the galactose disorders and both the fructose disorders I mentioned on the previous slide are all autosomal recessively inherited, as is the case with a lot of enzyme deficiencies, because even if you have a patient who's heterozygous and they've got about half as much enzyme as most people, that's usually enough to prevent the symptoms from arising. That brings us to the end of this video. If you liked it and you want me to make more, please like my videos on YouTube and subscribe to my YouTube channel. I won't bore you with the details about search engine optimization or social proof, but just know that even though it only takes you a couple seconds to do those things, it really helps me out a lot.